You're listening to the Packernet Podcast Network. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome once again to the Packernet Podcast. I am your host and resident panelist, as always, Ryan Schlipp. Check us out online, packernet.com. Find me on Twitter, pack underscore that app. Well, I'm assuming the title kind of gave her away, but today we're going to do something that I don't do enough, and that is go at the Minnesota Vikings. As you know, I, for whatever reason, have a little bit more disdain toward the Bears as I do the Vikings. Um, And I think the majority of Packer fans are the opposite. Not that they love the Bears, but I think most Packer fans would would tell you that their disdain for the Vikings is above and beyond probably any other team. You know, just some people hate the 49ers or the Cowboys or whatever. But um, anyways, the reason for the sudden shift, for, well, the first thing that came to mind, and I had no intention of doing a laughing at the enemy, despite the fact the Vikings did lose, was talking to my half-Mexican lawyer, Blaine, and he just said kind of out of the blue, I really need you to do a laughing at the Vikings thing. And I just kind of chuckled and was like, oh yeah, you should do that, right? They got spanked with the Lions. It's pretty funny. And he said something to the effect of uh, the Vikings being underdogs. And somehow that completely slipped by my radar. Probably because I am not involved in Vikings Twitter or any of that. I, I don't know. I don't know how I didn't see that. But it really just kind of sparked something in me that I was surprised, stunned actually to see. And I, and I, I mean, I had come into this with a full understanding, and I think most people, including Vikings fans, did that this was not necessarily going to be a walk in the park. Um, the Vikings have their ups and downs, and the Lions seem to be on a bit of a tear, but the Vikings are still a 10 win. What were they, 10 and 2 at the time? 10 and 3? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what they are now. 10 and something. And for the rest of that call, that was just sticking in my head. I couldn't stop thinking about it. Like, did he say they were underdogs? I'm pretty sure he did. I can't. They couldn't have been underdogs. There's no way. And then, as you know, if you've been listening to Packernet After Dark, I had um, somebody call in and say that the Vikings are the biggest frauds in history or whatever. And I think it was just a flippant, ha ha, you guys lost to the Lions thing. And I, I looked into it. And that's when I started pulling up some stats, and I was like, holy cow. Then I saw on Twitter, again, I apologize for being so not plugged into this. I should have already been on top of this. I was not. I I guess I just kind of disconnected from the Vikings. They're, you know, way out in front, not worried about them. They're not as good as their record, but they're they're obviously a pretty good football team, et cetera, et cetera. And I just kind of left it there. I didn't look at them. I didn't acknowledge them. I didn't really care. I didn't, they didn't mean anything to me. I had no idea the troubles they were having on defense, and I saw somebody tweet out that the Lions are no longer the worst defense in the NFL. The Cardinals are 32nd in points, and the Vikings are 32nd in yards given up this season. 32nd. And uh, at that point, alarm bells just started going off, and I said, all right, we got to do this, because I, 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 I can't ignore this anymore. This is, this is massive. This is a 10 and, t- 10 and 3 team-ish. I should look it up so I can know what I'm talking about. I knew it 30 seconds ago. Now I'm doubting myself. They're 10 and 3. All right. So the, the, the biggest issue that I'm having right now is I don't know the best way to unpack all this. I really don't. Um, I, I've kind of got two separate things, and, and the, the second thing branches off into independent things as well. I've got the case to lay out for the Vikings being the biggest fraudulent team in NFL history and just laying out some of the stuff that's going on with them. Some of it you already know. But then there's also just sort of a regular old laughing at the enemy segment. But it ties in because, well, it ties in because we can laugh at them, but also they don't sound like a 10-3 and team. As much as they want to push back on the fraud thing, they actually sound incredibly... Uh, like the Green Bay Packers. In fact, why don't we just start there? We can maybe jump back and forth here, but I want you to listen to this and tell me what this sounds like. Tell me if you recognize this. And I'll, I'll tell you what, I'm going to give you the answer just so you don't catch it later. 
By the way, this is the Purple Pocket Podcast. We've done this once before on a Laughing at the Vikings episode. It was fantastic. Um, but just just listen to this and try to listen for how many parallels there are to what Packer fans are going through. And the reason I bring that up is because if the Vikings are a 10-3 and three team and the Packers are a 5-8 and eight team, there shouldn't be that much in common. But the Vikings do sound a lot like a 5-8 and eight team. Look, this video isn't even going to have an intro, man. I'm just using my old school intro for this because I got to get right to the business, bro. This needs to change right now. Ed Donatel, man. Defensive coordinator, for those that didn't know. Ed Donatel. I sat back. You're going to be hearing a lot about him today. You know what I'm saying? And after that game yesterday, man, that just straight up pissed me off. You know what I mean? Watching how Kirk Cousins, Justin Jefferson had such a good game, but yet... They fall short because the defense don't hold up the end of their bargain. Now, listen, it's deeper than just yesterday, though. This is the thing, bro. Ed Donatel's defense has given up 400-plus yards in five straight games. They're giving away some of my good stuff here, which is why I wanted to do the good stuff in the videos, but it still works. There's no good way to do this. Five games in a row. The Packers, by the way, I think three or four games the entire season. That's it. They've done five in a row over 500 yards, uh, 400 yards. Five straight games, 400 plus yards, bro. We are not winning a playoff game like that. Things need to be changed. Now, I guess the one silver lining is we have time, okay? Time is on our side as of right now, so we can make some changes. I mean, they asked Kevin O'Connell during the postgame conference, um, or actually, no, they, it was today, actually. You know what I mean? The Monday conference that... Things need to change, and he, he obviously, he knows that, man. You know, he's paying attention. He understands what's going on, and he knows some things have to be changed, man. We have to be more aggressive on defense. Listen, being ranked dead last in yards allowed and shit, like, you can't tell me. So the, the, the numbers are different, but we're talking about the same thing. Sick and tired of X, Y, and Z with this defense. I'm over it. And I'm sick of this defensive coordinator. We need to make a change. This is what Vikings fans are saying just a couple weeks before they're about to go into the playoffs. I can't wait to get rid of this guy. It's a joke. He continues. That the Vikings have the absolute worst personnel in the NFL. I mean, we have Daniil Hunter, Zadarius Smith, Patrick Peterson, which he's not in his prime anymore, but he's still solidified. You know what I'm saying? Eric Kendricks. Dog, like, come on. He, I, I kind of got cut off. He's saying... He refuses to believe that they have the worst personnel. Is this not what you hear basically me say every day about the Green Bay Packers? You can't tell me. He's saying that we have the 32nd ranked defense in terms of yards with Zadarius and Daniil, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And he goes through the list like I always go through the list. We we, We have too much talent to be this bad. Come on, man. You know, Cameron Cameron Dantzler got burnt a couple times yesterday, but he's coming right back off injury. We got Harrison Smith out there. Bro, our personnel is legit, man. Our defensive personnel is legit. I can at least say we should at least be ranked like 16, 15, 16 in the NFL. That's, again, and, and you know, for, for Packers, it's a little bit more even optimistic than that for the for the defense. It's you know, we, we, we shouldn't be bottom of the barrel. We should we should be top 10 at least, or, or you know, yeah, at least top 15, which we haven't been, at least not recently. It's, it's a direct parallel, but it gets better. Listen to this. Okay, and this is the thing. We made Mike White look like a superstar quarterback. We made Mac Jones look like a superstar quarterback. I mean, we made Andy Dalton look good. Every quarterback we've played has looked amazing, bro. And my thing is this, we're going to get into playing the Indianapolis Colts this Saturday. And what makes me feel like Matt Ryan ain't going to look any, he's not, Matt Ryan is not going to look any different than what Jared Goff looked or any other quarterback that we play look. Matt Ryan is a veteran, bro. He, he's, he's smart enough to know how to read defenses. And, and the thing is this, we play that soft down the shell, trust me, Matt Ryan will throw for 300 plus yards. I can, you can book it right now, bro. The thing, man, we, this week, I mean, it, Tell me I'm wrong. Does this not sound like Packernet After Dark with all the with with the phone calls just lighting it up? What what is he uh, going through the list of of garbage quarterbacks that we made look like superstars? That is a, that's a classic Packers thing. The Vikings are going through the exact same thing. 
He's also talking about that they're, they're, they're tired, sick and tired of number one, not being aggressive, not blitzing enough. But number two, the big one, playing too soft. And, and, and they're especially upset because they're coming from a, a defensive f- uh, system that was much more aggressive. And now they're seeing this guy play soft. They're watching guys drop into coverage, which I, I, I've got so much I told you so coming. It's unbelievable with this defense. I freaking told you. Guys dropping in coverage. Daniil Hunter dropping in coverage. Daniil Hunter struggling in a 3-4 system. All this stuff I told you. That's actually all I had to say, but I'll probably say it 19 more times because it feels so good. I don't know what it is with... I don't get a lot of stuff right, but when I when those few times when I call out Vikings fans for being overly optimistic and not seeing what's blatantly in front of their face, I feel like I get that one. Although I didn't expect them to be 10-3, and three, but to be fair, they don't deserve it. Anyways, that pretty much summarizes it. So, so the thing is, the Minnesota Vikings are not all that dissimilar. And, and I'm sure Vikings fans, oh, no, we're, we're very different. Rodgers is playing worse than Cousins. You don't have a Justin Jefferson on your team. You don't have a Dalvin Cook on your team. You don't have as good of an offensive line. You don't have a TJ Hawkinson, so you don't have as good of an offense. And uh, so there, there's the difference. Even if that's true which I, Dalvin Cook isn't as good as Aaron Jones, but yeah, Justin Jefferson, we don't have a Justin Jefferson, you're right. You're, you, the quarterbacks are probably fairly comparable, although, uh, never mind. It, does, it doesn't matter. Let's just call them comparable. Even still, let's just let me just grant you that your offense is significantly better. Your defense is significantly worse. So explain the record discrepancy to me. I don't think it does explain the discrepancy. Beyond that, if we look at our last six games, Green Bay, in terms of points, has scored 135, Minnesota 139. Now, the defenses are fairly close, too, but that's kind of the point. The Packers have allowed 156 points, Minnesota 169. Point differential, Packers negative 21, Minnesota negative 30. Explain to me how you're a 10-win team and we're a 5-win team. Explain to me how you have a better team than the Green Bay Packers, period. In fact, allow me to take it a step further. I believe I've gone over this already on uh, Packernet After Dark. Looking at DVOA, which looks at your wins, the quality of your wins, and the quality of your opponent that you went up against. Minnesota Vikings are ranked 21st with a negative 7.2 DVOA. They're 10 and 3. Negative 7.2% DVOA means that according to DVOA and their formula, the Minnesota Vikings are 7.2% worse than an average football team. The Packers rank 15th, negative 0.7, meaning they're basically dead average. They're average. And, and they rank inside the top 15, which means they're top half and better than the Vikings. And that's total for the season. That's not recently. That's not since the Packers offense picked it up. If you're talking recently, the Green Bay Packers rank 14th, the Minnesota Vikings rank 23rd. Green Bay with a 0.8% DVOA, which is to say better than your average team. Minnesota 9% worse than your average team. If you look at offense, the Minnesota Vikings with their elite offense compared to this garbage Packers offense, you know what DVOA says? Minnesota's offense, 18th with a negative 1% DVOA. Green Bay, 11th. 7.5%. 7.5% better than your average team. Just leaving aside the, the, the issue of being fraudulent for just a moment. You're not even as good as the Packers. You don't even have a, an above 500 quality football team based on DVOA, based on point differential, based on anything that I can see. But let's just run through this real quick. They're not even a top 20 team via DVOA. They're the only team in NFL history with a 10-win record with a negative point differential. uh, the, The next lowest is 15 with an average of, I believe, 130 if you have 10 wins. But I, I, I took it a step further. Looking at the closest teams, that is to say, what is your win-loss percentage? Um, high, I, I guess highest win-loss percentage still with a negative point differential. The highest in history right now is 0.769, which is the Minnesota Vikings. 
The next highest, two teams with a .688. For those that don't know or couldn't do the quick math in their head, .688 is an 11-5 record. That would be the 2020 Cleveland Browns and the 2012 Indianapolis Colts. The Browns in 2020, again, with with not as, as good of a record, so if we're talking the quantity of how big of a fraud are you, because let, let's just be honest, we're not even disputing whether or not they're frauds, right? By any definition, they're frauds. 2019 Packers were frauds. We're not disputing their fraudulent nature. And, and most teams are frauds I, I, to, to some degree or another. That is to say, you don't perfectly represent the exact record you would expect based on your production. Some are going to be right in line. Some are going to be higher wins. Some are going to be lower wins. The question is, are they the biggest frauds? Cleveland, with a worse record in 2020, had a negative 5.7 DVOA, which is to say they were a better football team according to DVOA. Also, their offense ranked 14th in points and yards. Their defense was 21st and 17th points and yards. Not 32nd. The Colts would be the closest uh, potential team. And we got to see where the Vikings end up because we obviously if they lose out the rest of the season, they're going to have a lesser record, although their point differential probably goes further negative in that regard. So that, you know, widens that out. But they had an 11-5 and record. Their DVOA was negative 16.2. They ranked 26th. Defense ranked 21st in points, 26th in yards. So better defense slightly worse via DVOA, but also a worse record. This would be close in comparison. I don't have a direct conversion chart, but there has never been a team with as good of a record as the Vikings that are as bad, ever. The 2012 Colts might be as bad. They didn't have as good of a record. By the way, I had somebody bring up the 2019 Green Bay Packers. Well, they were frauds too. On on Twitter, it was, can anybody make a case for a bigger, more fraudulent team? They didn't make a case. They just said 2019 Packers. 2019 Packers uh, point differential was in the 60s, positive 60s, and they were ninth via DVOA, ninth best team with a 7.7% DVOA. Our defense also ranked ninth in points, so they were a top 10 defense in terms of points, 18th in yards. Again, that's compared to the 32nd ranked defense in terms of yards for the Minnesota Vikings. It's not close. So I, 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 I was, I'm still shocked by this. I keep saying the same things over and over again. And I, I mean, I'm, I'm putting this stuff on Twitter and I'm ready for it to blow up and people to get angry. They're, they're not, by the way, so far. But I, I could see why somebody could easily look at this and say, you're just a bitter Packer fan, blah, blah, blah. I'm telling you, this is not trolling. I wish I hated the Vikings enough to where I'm doing this just to get under their skin. Even as a five-win team to be that petty, I'm not. I'm genuinely stunned. I didn't know. I went on a, a Bears podcast with a Bears, Packers, Vikings, Lions fans. I think it was prior to their New England game, and I, I said, you know, it, it, they they lost a game, they won a game. I, th- I think what what a I gotta look. I keep going down these paths, and I don't know the details. And now I gotta go look it up so I can actually sound smart and stuff. Not sound like a bumbling moron, even though that's kind of what I do on this show. Yeah, so so they beat the Bills, and that was massive. Then they got annihilated 40 to 3 by Dallas. And I said, okay, New England is sort of the tiebreaker here. That was my genuine thought at the time. It was, you know, they they seem legit, but they've got these weird things, which is no different than the past. It's no different than the Vikings and a lot of other teams in, in previous years and this year, where you, you just can't quite put your finger on. Are they a good team or not? Now, l- listen, I had uh, Peter reach out, P-E-D-E-R, very uh, Nordic. Larson is his last name. I shouldn't use first last name, but the point is very Vikings fanish. It's actually funny how stereotypical a lot of uh, people from Minnesota are. It's, it's a lot like uh, all the skis in Chicago and whatnot. Anyways, his main point was, so what? The record still is what it is. They still went and won those games in, 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 you know, the close games, which count, and they do, I agree. And so understand, this isn't necessarily all-encompassing when I say that, you know, when I point these things out, as if to say that they are one of the worst teams in football. They did win these games. 
I think there is some things to be encouraged about. For example, they had a long track record of being the team that could not win close games. They're not winning all of them. Now, if it's me, I'm looking at my head coach going, that's, that's, a, that's a big deal. That's a real big deal. Especially as a Packer fan sitting here seeing our team not put out 100%. I understand how important it is to have guys show up in clutch situations, and those are clutch situations. It's something to build on. It's important. It's an important part of a job for a head coach is to be able to, you know, win. (laughs) It's also a reality that not anybody can necessarily do what the Vikings did. I think what a lot of this has to do with isn't, I think, I think a more accurate way to frame the Vikings situation isn't so much that they're just flat out bad. Or, or slightly subpar, right? Negative one DV or a point differential, negative seven, you know, 7% worse or whatever. But, but that just kind of points to it being flat. This is just what they are all the time. I don't know. Beating the Buffalo Bills 33 to 30 in overtime is, is not necessary. I mean, yes, any given Sunday, but that's not necessarily something any old scrub team can do. I do think they have potential that other teams don't have, but they've also got a dark side to them like no other team. And so I guess the best way to look at it is they have got some high highs, but also some really low lows, and it balances out to being about subpar. But regardless of it, and, and, and the other excuse that, that I see is, well, point differential is stupid because they lost 40 to three. Well, I mean, that, that granted, it's one game, you can have one bad game and that can throw everything off, but it still counts, right? I don't think, I mean... All you're doing is explaining how it became what it became. I mean, it's like, yeah, we have a point differential of negative 50 over 10 games, but we lost five points a game over 10 games. What do you expect? Well, yeah, that's you're just explaining what happened. You're not even disagreeing with me. Losing a game by 37 points is massive, and you can't just throw it out. Right, I mean, it would be no different than me me going. Okay, so they're ten and two, but let's be honest, one score games could go either way. So let's just throw all those out. So the Lions win doesn't count. Saints win, Bears win, Dolphins win, the Arizona win, the Washington win, the Buffalo win, uh, the Patriots win, the Jets win. None of those wins count. Which is to say, your only real win this entire season was against the Green Bay Packers in Week One, and that was Week One. So we could throw that out. You can't just throw stuff out. Now, there's nuance and there's context, and, and it's good to know, you know, these things. Same with the, the 40 to 3. But it doesn't get thrown out. And again, it still doesn't explain everything. If it was just point differential, but they were really high in DVOA and were like the fourth best defense and all that stuff, okay, fine. You probably throw out point differential, right? They, they, they don't win by a lot, but they win consistently enough, and they had one real bad game that, that they just, you know, they had a rough flight in or something. It was actually at home, but okay. Rough, uh, somebody poisoned the uh, the breakfast that they all collectively ate off of the one plate. I don't know. But that doesn't exactly explain the five games in a row of giving up over 400 yards on defense. The calls to fire Donatel. The point is, everybody sees there's an issue. It's not as though this is a fake perceived issue because of one game in Dallas. Nobody cares about the one game in Dallas. See how many times when I play, go through these videos, you hear them talk about Dallas. I'm guessing zero. I don't know, maybe once. I don't recall. Because the, the real story here isn't that this is a real high-quality team that is absolutely a 10-3 and three team. That is what they are deserving of. And, and I kind of go back and forth on the, deser- the deserving thing. They do deserve the 10 wins because they actually did win it. So if you catch me saying they don't deserve it, just understand, I, I do mean they do deserve it. What I'm trying to say is the quality of the football team doesn't equate to that. But life isn't fair. You get what you, what, what, you, get, what you get. That's what you went out and earned. That's what you got. That's not how you go. You don't go to the playoffs based on point differential. You go based on your record. You got the record. You, you maybe didn't deserve it, quote unquote, based on how good you are, but that's so what? That has nothing to do with anything. Anyways, the point is everybody knows the issues exist. Even Vikings fans who hate these these the idea of fraudulent, which, by the way, they're going to admit it in a couple of years, just like Packer fans. I didn't want to say the Packers were fraudulent. I don't exactly remember my stance on it. I think it was very similar to a lot of Vikings fans, which is, you know, a win is a win. Something, 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 I don't know, it doesn't matter. But 
they'll come around when it's not in the moment for those that haven't already. Because you're a fan and you want to believe, right? Can't be a fan of a 10-win team and be like, we're never going to win. But it is still sort of a standalone fact. If we were to put fraud, it, it, fraud is not all-encompassing. It doesn't tell you everything, but it's still a thing. Right? I think one of the big objections to uh, being called a fraud is that it's, it's an all-encompassing thing that just means you're the worst. You're not deserving. You don't actually, you shouldn't actually have all those wins. It just, it means more than it means. And whether or not you even care, the other point that he had brought up is, so what? We got the wins. We got the division. We're going to the playoffs. Fair enough. If there are Vikings fans listening, I'm not trying to tell you you shouldn't be enjoying winning. I've been saying for I don't know how long to Packer fans to not complain about winning. However, fraud does mean something. And it can mean different things. I mean, again, in this case, it's not even so much inconsistency because, again, how many one-score wins have they, have they won? I mean, it's, it's you know, win by four, win by three, win by five, win by four. It's, it's, so consistency is there, but there are some issues. The first one is, with that negative point differential, it tells you, again, that there's really, really low lows. Very serious problems. When you look at, again, 24th ranked defense in terms of points, 32nd in terms of yards. You look at, again, five straight games of over 400 yards given up. And then on top of that, the fact that almost every single one of your games was a one-score win, and that those are very, uh, you know, toss up e 50 50 e it does mean that you shouldn't have a lot of confidence in the team that you have right now going forward. It, it, it's similar to when I talked about Christian Watson, and I said there are some stats that are reliable moving forward that you can trust will continue, and some stats that you should have almost no trust in. And unfortunately for Christian Watson, um, touchdowns, ugh, touchdowns per game, I think it was, one of, the most, uh, one of the least reliable stats in terms of the correlation between how many he or anybody has this year compared to next year. One-score wins are very unreliable. That's one of the things a lot of people will look at when you try to project out how good a team will be at the start of a season. If you lost a lot of games, but they were very close games, you might project that they could be a much better team this year because those losses were unreliable in terms of predicting the future. But if you have a lot of one-score wins, it's also unreliable. And if we throw out the one-score games, and I know I just said, well, you can't just do that. Well, you can and you can't. Just stick with me. If you throw out the one-score games, and just for the sake of argument, I'm just going to say within seven, because I think there's one within eight. I'm just going to give you that one. The Vikings have three wins. If you include eight, they have one win, and that was against Green Bay. But again, I'll give them, I'll give them Arizona, Miami, and Green Bay. But then if you look at the losses, same thing. What do you get? They lost to Detroit, Philly, and Dallas. Three wins, three losses. And again, it brings them back to being about a 500 team. Again, I'm not saying they didn't deserve those wins, but a lot of one-score wins come down to very, very... I mean, over the course of four quarters, a lot of things happen that can alter one score, which is what makes it unreliable looking into the future. And it doesn't necessarily just mean next year. I think it's true that there's something to be said about a team that wins a lot of one-score games. Like I said earlier, you could probably put that on your coach. Team shows up ready to play, et cetera, et cetera. But if you put it on, you know, attitude, want to, drive, desire, clutchness, what happens when your team starts to get down on itself? What happens when you're starting to develop a reputation for being frauds and some of, your pe some of the people on your team start to believe it? doesn't take much to alter that one score. So I don't want to over-explain anything, or not over-explain, but um, oversell anything, I guess, or try to tell you that this means more than it does. But if you are a Vikings fan, understand that this doesn't mean nothing. What I would say this means more than anything else is that it's very, very important that you win a Super Bowl this year. I think your team is winning a lot of games that you shouldn't be winning. And I think all indications are that this is not something that's going to continue. And that's not even getting to the part where we discuss how your team is going to change moving forward, players leaving and whatnot. 
Anyways, why don't we go ahead and take a break, and then we'll start running through a couple of these clips of, uh, you know, Vikings fans and media and whatnot. See what they have to say about everything. We'll take a break. We'll be right back. I want to tell you guys real quick about our new sponsor, Factor. Factor makes delicious, ready-to-eat meals, and they get sent right to your door. They have 35 different options every single week that you can choose from, including keto, calorie smart, vegan and veggie, and more. And there's even more to enjoy with over 55 nutrition-packed add-ons that help make your weekly meal planning even more delicious. There's no prep work. There's no messing up six different bowls, mixing stuff. Factor meals are 100% ready to heat and eat. No prep, no cook, no cleanup. Factor is also very flexible with your schedule. You can get as much or as little as you need by choosing between 6 to 18 meals per week. You can also pause or reschedule your deliveries anytime. Factor is less expensive than takeout, and every meal is dietitian approved. So head to factormeals.com slash packdaddy50 and use code packdaddy50 to get 50% off. That's code packdaddy50 at factormeals.com slash packdaddy50 to get 50% off. Ladies and gentlemen, let me ask you a question. Have you ever heard in your entire life of test driving a phone network? Well, now you have, because U.S. Cellular is going to let you test drive their network for free for 30 days. So anywhere you go where you got some dead spots, where your service isn't super strong, you're trying to listen to the podcast and it drops out when you go here because you got no internet service anymore, real simple, just whip out your phone, do a little beep boop bop boop that's you pushing the buttons to go to the right place and you can get the app and try it out for yourself so go ahead and test drive u.s cellular's award-winning network free for 30 days that's u.s cellular built for us terms apply awards based on open signal independent data so go to uscellular.com for all the details so again i um I don't have a particular order or flow to all of this, um, but we're just going to kind of take it as it comes and comment as we as we go along here. First of all, um, and again, a lot of really good content creators, just like with the Chicago Bears, and I don't want to do all this just to rub it in everybody's face and say, ha ha, I know, I should, but I'm not going to do that. It's kind of going to come out that way anyways, but that's not the intent. The reason I want to play some of this stuff is because there are a lot of Vikings fans that are going to push back on some of the stuff I'm saying. They'll tell you that, yeah, well, you know, losing to the Lions isn't that big of a deal. The point differential thing isn't that big of a deal, whatever. They got excuses for all of it. Here's here's the thing, though. If your rationale only works in reverse, it's useless. If you find yourself constantly explaining things after the fact about why it happened and why it's okay and why it makes total sense with everything, I think that's dishonest. I think if you have a good understanding of what's actually going on, you should have a good understanding of what's going to happen in the future. Now, granted, I did have a Vikings fan I talked to on Twitter tell me they were going to lose to the Lions. I'm sure he wasn't the only one. But the point is, a lot of the Vikings fans who are saying we aren't frauds were saying we're not going to lose to the Lions. We shouldn't be underdogs to the Lions. They were very upset about it. And so, again, the reason I play this is to demonstrate that Vegas was trying to explain to you that you are fraud. There is no way on planet Earth that if you look at records, the Vikings should have been underdogs to the Lions. What Vegas is telling you is that the record is not accurate. What they're telling you is that the Lions are better than the Vikings. Well, it was in Detroit and it was only like two and a half points. Okay, well then what they're telling you is you're just as good. Does that make you feel better? If we do the whole three points thing, which again, I don't know if that's actually accurate, but again, there's a lot of rationalizing. No, 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 no. We're not frauds. That's not true. We're really good. We're a lot better than all these other teams. We're just as good as all the other 10 and, forgot already, 10 and three teams. <laughs> well, again, if, if what you're saying is true, you should have a pretty good ability to read into the future. For example, when I looked at Dallas and then Tennessee, and then Philadelphia, what I had said is that Dallas and Philadelphia are much better matchups than Tennessee is. 
Tennessee, I was much more scared of Tennessee than Philadelphia. Now, if I had been wrong, what needs to happen is that I change my understanding of things. Or, you know, possibly think it could have been a fluke, but it did. I mean, we didn't beat the Eagles, but we were still a much more competent team than we were against Tennessee. In fact, Philadelphia went pretty much similar to what I had said because I mostly was looking at the offense when I said that they, we would be a much better team. Right. And listen, the bottom line is if 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 they are not very good against the run, our offense is going to do well. If they are, we're going to struggle. And so far, that's that's played out pretty well. Dallas, Philly and Chicago are bad against the run. We scored 31, 33 and 28 points. Tennessee is one of the top run defense teams. We scored 17. So the point is, I can stand by it. If you're saying we're not frauds and we shouldn't be underdogs to Detroit and then Detroit kicks the living daylights out of you. Maybe you're not understanding your team rightly. Expectations is when, you know, bad things happen to them. I am more than content being the underdog in Detroit. I am more than content with people still doubting us. Let us let them keep doubting us. Let them keep. It shouldn't be one of those, well, we need this motivation. I'm not saying they need the motivation, but to your point, it's a little extra fuel to the fire, and I'm, I'm here for it. I'm all about, you're going to tell me that because, Lions have won four out of five games against some mm, okay teams at best and had a close loss against Buffalo that they should be favored at home against the 10 and two team that have played by and large, those same teams and who had the close win in Buffalo. So. Now, do you see what I'm telling you right now? He, he's laying out a good point. If your understanding of how to judge the team is a uh, record and, and I guess common opponent, if, if you just look at that, then, yeah, the Vikings should be better. Hey, yeah, the, the Lions beat them, but, but we beat those teams too. When in reality, if you're talking about, well, they don't have a win streak. I, I was thinking they did. They, they lost that Thanksgiving game threw me off. They lost to Buffalo. But they've won um, five out of their last six. Well, we beat most of the, well, at the time, one of those is the Vikings. It was four out of their last five. We beat the same opponents. Well, you're talking about the Packers and the Bears. They beat the Giants and the Jaguars. You haven't played them. But beyond that, Vegas is looking at the quality of your team right now compared to the quality of their team right now. And I know that's what he's saying, but it's, it's the metrics. And again, what I'm getting at is that Vikings fans that believed in their 10 and, and 2 at the time record said it was absurd to be underdogs to the Lions and they shouldn't lose to the Lions, and they did. Right? Sorry, I'm not listening to it. But hey, it's all good. It's all gravy at this point. We're just going to roll into there. And we'll, we'll, we'll show people what we got. It, it, it's really that simple to me. It, it doesn't need to be any more complicated than that. What do you say? So there you go. We'll see. Well, we did. 34 to 23. And by the way, a um, lot of talk amongst Vikings fans about how upsetting it is because Justin Jefferson kind of broke a franchise record. Apparently the record is still held by somebody who did it in the playoffs, but that doesn't count because it was in the playoffs as opposed to the regular season. So I don't, whatever. Justin Jefferson had 223 yards, I think it was. Kirk Cousins had a, a nearly perfect passer. They're talking about that constantly over and over and over and over and over again. He scored 23 points. That kind of sucks, especially when you're talking about a record-breaking day for your offense. In fear that I'm not going to be able to find it because I can't get these all queued up. I should have been more organized with this. But somebody had said on here, we might be a winless team if not for Justin Jefferson. I think that might be true. The fact that your offense currently ranks 10th and only scored 23 points against one of the worst defenses in all of football. Yeah, you took the mantle, 30, ranking 32nd in yards given up. They rank 31st in points, 31st in yards. I would venture to say that at least over the course of the season, maybe they're better at defense than you right now, if we take a four or five game sample size or something, recent games. But 31st in points, 31st in yards is worse than what you've got going on. You scored 23 points, and Justin Jefferson had a Hall of Fame game. And again, that doesn't work to your advantage. Every time you talk about a positive, it just makes things worse. Yeah, but look how good this is. Then explain why things are so bad. Everything else must be really, really, really bad. Well, I thought you had a really good offensive line. I thought you had an elite running back. You're actually healthy for like the first time ever. Don't you also have Thielen? Didn't you just get Hawkinson? How did you only score 23 points with your quarterback playing a, 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 the best game of his career 
according to some Vikings fans. Justin Jefferson having the best game of his career. And again, you've got really high quality offensive line, at least certainly much better than you've ever had in the past. Remember when that was a really big problem for a long time. Yes, Ed Ingram is a problem, and the center, I think, was a a replacement, but didn't seem to affect your quarterback much. But again, Hawkinson, is Irv Smith still around? What's he doing these days? Or is he down again? Thielen, Dalvin, Cook, he scored 23 points. Let me tell you something. As a fan of a team that's had a high-quality quarterback-wide receiver combo, top 10 offense sounds nice. That ain't nothing. If the Packers ended up with a bad defense and a top 10 as in 10th offense with Rodgers and Devontae, that is trash. And I'm not even talking about the defense. I'm just saying that sucks. We're disappointed. And it's happened. It's happened plenty of times. And it's disappointing every time. 23 points against maybe the worst defense in the entire NFL, while your wide receiver and quarterback have career games, is a massive indictment of not just your defense, but your offense. I also want to play this. This is from uh, Locked on Vikings. Um, I think it's a very reasonable take. I think it makes a lot of sense. In fact, he explains a lot of things, including uh, the home field advantage and all that stuff. But again, the conclusion is essentially, essentially rationalizing. That doesn't mean he's wrong, but it's rationalizing. Why would Vegas do this? Well, it's because of something stupid that we should disregard. Would be my summary of his summary. Is that the reality? Let's hear what he had to say. On today's show... I want to talk to you about the sort of topic, I guess, that's dominating the week, which is like, why, oh, why are the Lions favored? And I I think I have some understanding, but the betting line stuff has been wonky. But I also want to talk about some prop bets like we do every week, as well as uh, your bold prediction about that line. So as I look at it right now at Bet Online, um, the Vikings are two point underdogs at the Lions. Now, home field advantage conventional wisdom for a long time was that home field advantage was worth three points. So it would mean that like the Vikings are one point favorites on a neutral field, but because it's the road, they'll say that that's not really the case anymore. Home field advantage was potentially overstated for a long time. And now it's kind of more like one and a half points uh, is what home field advantage is. So it's Hubbard. And depending on what book you're at too, you, you could see bet online has it as two, but you could kind of say that the, the, the books think that the Vikings and Lions on a neutral field are very close to about the same team. But here's what's really, really weird. It wasn't that way all week. And the way that this line has evolved over the week should tell you that I don't think the betting markets are very sure about this. Um, because it started, at least on Bet Online, it opened with the Vikings as one point favorites. And then betters slammed that really hard, and like 98% of the money was on the Lions there. And then it went all the way to 2.5 Vikings, and then the, the betters slammed that really hard, or 2.5 Lions favorite. Um, and betters slammed that really hard, bet the Vikings and the money line a whole bunch really hard. And then it's now it's sort of settled in, into this sort of middle ground at, at minus 2 or minus 1.5, depending on where you see it. And so it kind of tells me that the, Vegas has been kind of all over, and the public has this idea that the Vikings and Lions are very similar teams, and if the line went too far one way or another, they were going to hammer it. Um, the point I want to make here, though, is I think a, a lot of this is driven by like public perception, right? For me, the betting line is a really good proxy for public perception. What does the public actually think of these? And it helps me, too, when I'm like, man, the the national media isn't giving the Vikings any credit. And then if they're, like, favored by three against the Jets, which are a possible playoff team, I'm like, okay, maybe they are giving some credit. But here it's like, wow, the public really doesn't like the Vikings here to have them up with a a five-win team. That's, like, almost historic. That's only happened, like, one or two times, like, ever, where an 800 team, a 10-2 and team or, or equivalent, has been an underdog against a five and seven team or equivalent this late in the season, right? Unless you want to talk about like two and one versus zero and three teams. And we have a lot of priors or something like that. So what, what is going on? Look, if you want to look at the advanced stats and DVOA and stuff, you'll actually see an argument. Will Raggett's wrote an article about that on, on SI that in terms of like production metrics that can be more productive, that uh, more predictive that the, that the Lions have basically gone toe for toe, toe to toe with the Vikings over this season, and it's just that the Vikings have been winning their close games, which I've sort of argued, like, yeah, they've won their close games. They should be 
given credit for that, even though we all kind of understand that if the Vikings have five more close games, we don't expect them to go five and zero, right? Like we we understand that, but winning those close games is still like you know they made good plays in the clutch, they did situational masters and stuff. They should be credited for that. That's the way I feel about it. Um, but I also think that th- these two teams are victims of expectations in a in a sense. All right, he's taking way too long to get to his points here, but he, he's saying a lot of things that are that are what I've said and that are very, um, I think, very true. In fact, the only thing I would disagree with, and he, he's he's even laying out the case. You know, if you look at things that are he, in his words, more predictive than things like record. And I was I was hoping he was going to hurry up and get to the point where he says, but, but he's kind of he's he's like me. He cannot get to a point apparently, so I can't be mad at him. I just can't play it anymore because I want to get to a lot more stuff. So, number one, public perception is that the Vikings and the and the Lions are similar. Now, it's easy to look at that and say, well, yeah, I mean, people are victims of the moment. The Vikings have been struggling. The Lions look crazy good. And, and so, you know, they're just the hot team in terms of perception. They're not better. That would be the one argument kind of by itself. However, again... Look at the more predictive. He was talking about, I thought he said Reggets or something. I tried to look it up, but Aaron Schatz, maybe that's what he said, uh, wrote an article December 6th, the, wi- the Wild World of the 2022 Minnesota Vikings. And they're, they're going through a couple different things here. I think they're just kind of updating their rankings. But um, scroll down a little bit. It says, speaking of the Lions, you may have seen the 5-7 and seven Lions are favored in this week's game against the 10-2 and two Vikings. Clearly, Vegas odds makers are smoking whatever DVOA is smoking. I'm sure that's sort of a shot at the people who have been uh, trashing DVOA for giving the Vikings such a low rank. So smoking whatever they're smoking when it comes to the crazier the Vikings are having. Honestly, it doesn't matter what stat you look at. There's never been a 10-2 and two team anything like this year's Vikings. I've written about them so much, but things just get crazier and crazier as they reel off close win after close win. Check out the list of lowest 10-2 and two teams in DVOA history, and you can see just how far away the Vikings are from every other 10-2 and two team of the last 42 years except themselves in 2000. So they actually did a lot of the homework for me in terms of DVOA. But 10-2 and two teams, they have a negative 5.5. This, this was at the time. I think they're worse now. What did I say? They're negative 7-something? Currently at 10-3, at, at and three, which is a different record, so who knows, but negative 5.5% DVOA. The next worst was Minnesota in 2000 at positive 2.4. So, like I said, there's never been a negative point differential. There's also never been a negative DVOA for a team that was 10 and 2, except the Vikings. Then they've got their WEA, uh, WEA, WEI ranking. It's a different thing, I don't know, but that's negative 6.8. They rank 20th. The last time somebody was uh, that bad was Minnesota with three positive 3.4. He says, I added weighted DVOA to the table so you can see just how little these teams are similar to this year's Vikings. Many of the worst 10-2 and two teams were on the upswing getting hot in the second half of the season, the 98 Falcons, or rebounding from particularly bad performances very early in the season, the 2003 Patriots. But the 2022 Vikings are actually, well, not quite on the downswing, but three of their four best games of the season came back in weeks one through six before their bye. The Jets game this week is the fourth of those four games. I thought we might end up in a situation where the Vikings were not just the worst 10 and 2 team in DVOA history but also the worst uh also worse than all the 9 and 3 teams that doesn't turn out to be the case because the Vikings climbed a bit with 18.9 DVOA against the Jets so the Vikings do have one 9 and 3 team that was worse which is the 2022 Browns that's a team that I had said was close in contention to being bad I think there was another uh team that was even cl- the Colts 20 20- is it 2012 Colts or something? But check out the list of the worst 9-3 and three or 10-2 and two teams and how they finished the season. You've got 9-3 and three Cleveland, 10-2 and two Minnesota, 9-3 and three Atlanta, 9-3 and three Chicago, 9-3 and three Arizona, and then 10-2 and two Minnesota, and then, and then all 9-3 and three teams. By the way, 2019 Green Bay is uh, down further on this list at 9-3. and three. That's with a worse record. They were a better team with a worse record, as I had pointed out. The Vikings... Uh, the Vikings also stand out among history's 10 and 2 teams if we use conventional stats. For example, only six teams in NFL history have had negative net yards with a 10 and 2 record. The Vikings at negative 754 yards are the most negative of those stats. The 2010 Patriots, sorry, I think I read that wrong. 
Uh, only six teams in NFL history. Is that what I said? I thought I said the only one. Only six teams in NFL history. They have the worst at negative 754. The Patriots were at negative 445. The other 10 and 2 teams uh, that had net negative yards were the 84 Seahawks, 65 Browns, 86 Jets, and 60 Eagles. The Vikings also have the lowest point differential of any 10, 10 and 2 team in the history at, um, at positive 10. So they did go positive for a second until the Lions again. The 2019 Seahawks were at plus 36. Uh, the 2019 Seahawks were the only other 10-2 and two team below a positive 40. And he says, and here's what's even more remarkable. The Vikings are probably going to keep winning. The Vikings now have the number 30 remaining schedule in the NFL by average DVOA of opponent, with no games left against the top dozen teams in the league. DVOA will favor their opponents when they travel to Detroit this Sunday and Green Bay in Week 17, but those are definitely winnable games for an average team, even if Vegas doesn't have the Lions' favor. That's 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 re- remarkable for not, but not for the reasons that I've said or or the reason that he said. It's remarkable that DVOA is like, yeah, they're probably going to win out because they have such an easy schedule. However, they will probably lose to the Packers. Excuse me, the five-win Packers. You know why? Because we have a higher DVOA, especially weighted DVOA. According to DVOA, we are the better team. And that also flies in the face of what Mr. Luke Braun with Lockdown Vikings is saying about public perception. The public does not have a positive perception of the Green Bay Packers. If Vegas, and I'm not saying they will, they, they probably won't, and we'll see what happens with these next couple games, but if Vegas has the Packers favored, that flies in the face of everything that that is what he was saying. Because the Vikings should have a higher perception, positive perception than the Packers based on their record and based on the fact that the Packers are seen as, as, as completely falling off. I mean, they're not all hype. I mean, people have been hyped up about Detroit for a long time. And now that they're actually winning and going on a win streak, it's just through the roof. But again, the, the overall point here is you've got the public perception argument and Vegas doesn't really know what they're talking about and nobody knows what they're talking about. This is all just media hype and all that stuff versus statistics and, and analytics. Guess who won? Analytics by kind of a lot. Your positive 10 point differential dropped to negative one after facing the Lions, meaning you lost by 11. By the way, I I had mentioned um, consistency. He actually, in the same article, goes on and has a metric for consistency. And it kind of goes along with what I was saying. They're not the most consistent team, but they are consistent. So it's not as though they're they're a wildly inconsistent team. Um, One, two, let's see, they rank uh, 12th the 12th most consistent team. Green Bay, by the way, is 25th, which sounds about right. Anyways, why don't we speed round through a couple of these videos here? Uh, we got Purple FTW Podcast. He's got 10 things. Uh, we're not going to go through all 10, but we'll start with number one, I guess, talking about the defense. Again, giving you a picture of just how bad this is. And, and when I say it's similar to the Packers, it is. But remember, it's also worse somehow. Okay, so let's get started. Number one, the defense is the weak link. And that's uh, LMAO, obviously. But 400-plus yards in five straight games. They're going to be dead last in the league in yards allowed. The whole bend but don't break defense is, like, oh, yeah, we'll, we'll stop him between the 20, or you march between the 20s, we'll stop him in the red zone. It's like, cool. The Lions went 2-2 two two in the red zone, also threw uh, two 40-plus yard touchdowns. But other than that, you're really, really good. It's fantastic. And this is going to cost them, where if they don't make any changes on defense soon, this defense, as constituted, is going to have the Vikings be a one and done in the playoffs, including uh, if and when they host a playoff game in the wild card round, which I don't know. It really sucks. It, it does, especially since the offense is starting to get rolling. Kirk Cousins playing some of the best ball of his career. Stupid thing. Um, we'll end it there. Some of these uh, videos have been sitting here for a while, so when it gets caught up, it's like, oh, I got to reload this. It's like, you're an idiot. Here's if, if there ever was a case for wanting to get into the playoffs, other than just wanting to get into the playoffs. It's the fact that there's a very, very good chance that we would be the lowest seed and the Vikings would be the highest seed. I shouldn't say there's a very good chance. Well, what it is is the second highest seed, which means we would play the Vikings because the highest seed gets a bye. So the number two seed, which very possibly could be the Vikings, I mean, it's between two teams, essentially. Actually, it's not between because Dallas would be the other team, but Dallas could only be uh, the fifth seed would be the highest because they're in the same division as the Eagles, who are going to probably... Either way, even if Dallas gets it, then the Eagles will be the fifth. The point is, the I think the Vikings are pretty well locked into the number two, assuming they win out. And again, they have a very easy schedule going forward. The, the odds are, if we get in, we're getting the lowest seed, and the Vikings will have the number two seed, which means if we get in, 
it's almost guaranteed we're playing the uh, the Vikings right out of the gate. And you listen to Vikings fans, and they're like, things are just unraveling. How great would it be to not only beat the Vikings in the regular season to help propel us into the playoffs, but then be the team to knock them out of the playoffs? And you're like, well, what's the point? We're not going to win the Super Bowl anyways. Maybe not, probably not, but we get to dethrone the Vikings. Oh, we won the division. Really? We got further in the playoffs. <laughs> so there. There's also... Um, this video here I thought was really interesting. This is Luke Braun from Lockdown with Sam Ekstrom um, from, I don't know what, maybe he's a co-host or something. But I found this really interesting, and Vikings fans I'm sure are going to push back. It's funny, Luke, who's sitting here, his eyes get so big when he says this, he can't even believe he just said it. But remember how I said that the Vikings and the, the Packers are similar in that we have teams with talent that are just not getting the talent to come out, especially on defense? Listen to this. I also don't want to be a fraud. We, we had this conversation a couple weeks ago on the football party where I posed the question, is this, what percentage is Ed Donatel? What percentage is personnel? And I am of the belief that this is more than 50% personnel. Donatel's schematics are obviously part of the equation. I'm not saying it's not. But I also think that you, you just don't have necessarily a lot to work with in the linebacker group and your cornerbacks are not shut down. You can't count on um, one side of the field getting shut down. Cam Dantzler has always been a little bit vulnerable to big plays against Patrick Peterson's having a spectacular year. I wouldn't take anything away from him, but today he got, you know, beaten a couple times underneath. Got a couple. You, and you didn't have your star safety. The safeties got exposed today. Um, that I, hurt. I, I, they can't, can't really find missed him over the middle. Yeah, I mean, and Ken Bynum has been vulnerable too this year. Like, it, let's not pretend that just because he had a oh, game-winning sure. pick that Bynum hasn't had his share of mistakes. He has, absolutely. And today he was joined by Josh Metellus. I think that the knock on Donatel has got to be... Anyways, you get the point. So it's not even, you know, you've got the fire Donatel crowd, but you've also got a contingent saying, we just don't necessarily have a good enough defensive roster. And, and you can make similar arguments with the Packers to some degree, especially with Rashawn Gary being injured, but they have Daniil Hunter, and they have Zadarius Smith. They have all their key pieces to the best of my uh, understanding. They don't have the rookies, but I doubt that that, I mean, you're, you're going to tell me that you have Zadarius and Hunter and uh, your, your, your safeties and your corners and, and, you know, Patrick Peterson and all these guys that you've revered and prior to the season, we're talking about how great they're going to be but the reason that you're not good is because of the rookies. I, I don't think anybody's making that case, but just in case they are, please stop that. But this is an additional problem. When you're talking about a team that is fraudulent, biggest negative of being a fraud is that this is not going to continue. You're not actually a good team. You can celebrate the wins, that's fine, but celebrate it while it lasts. But the worst part is it's not easily remedied, whatever the issues are, because not only do you have a new defensive coordinator that you don't like, but you've got serious questions among personnel, and there's other people that are going to be talking about that, I think, if I can get to it. In fact, yeah, here we go. And play caller. Next up, number two, go back to a four-man front. So I said during the offseason that, was like, hey, Donatel's bringing the 3-4. And Vi By the way, didn't I say this a thousand times prior to the season? You can't just change from a 4-3 to a 3-4 and expect everything's going to be fine. Daniil Hunter has never done this in ent his entire life, been a stand-up outside linebacker. He's never been a drop-in coverage guy. He's done it like twice in his entire career. You cannot just make these wild changes and expect no growing pains. I said that a thousand times prior to this season. Vikings fans, we were champion at the bit. Say, like, hey, we haven't had the 3-4 uh, in forever. We all, we've always been a four-man front team, going back to Purple People Eaters, Williams Wall 2.0, Zimmer, all that stuff. But the Vikings did not have the personnel. I mean, yes, you brought in Harrison Phillips, even though he's not really a true zero tech. Also, you brought in Zadarius Smith, who's a great stand-up. Yeah, that, and I had said that you brought in Harrison Phillips. He played in a 4-3 for Buffalo. He's not a 3-4 guy. Zadarius is the only guy you brought in that was a 3-4 guy outside linebacker, but that's really about it. But uh, I feel like this transition has hurt Daniel Hunter the most. Oh, also, uh, I think it's say. limited the effectiveness of Diesel Dalvin Tomlinson, even though he's played really well. Uh, but going back to a uh, four-man front, so have Daniel be that permanent left defensive end or lining up against a right tackle, have Zadarius Smith be on the, uh, on the right side of the defense, the left side of the offense, he can stand up, he can handle Yeah, and that's going to hurt him.
in the dirt, whatever. And then you have Harrison Phillips as a one tech on the nose, and then have Diesel Devlin as well as Ross Blacklock play the three tech. That's what should happen. That's what should happen. I mean, screw the scheme at this point. Just go with what works and just get after it from there. Next up. They're not going to do that, obviously, as he knows. But what he's saying is, and and I had mentioned this, if you're going to change defensive coordinators, it's not going to be, or excuse me, if you're going to change scheme, 3-4-4-3, three, four, four, three, you better bring in a bunch of new personnel. Otherwise, we're talking about a multi-year thing. The, the, the Bears changed also, but they did a, a massive amount of overhauling. And even even at that, it, it's still it's still somewhat problematic. There's still a lot of overhauling that needs to be done. You need to bring in some four three defensive ends. Which, by the way, that that uh, pass rusher that everybody loves, the guy out of uh, I think it's what is it Alabama or is it Georgia? I don't know. I think it's Alabama. Kind of a smaller guy. I'm not saying he can't stick his hand in the dirt. I'm sure he's done everything over there in Alabama, but not sure that fits. You got to find guys that fit. Yeah, Will Anderson, six foot four, two forty three. Sounds like a stand-up outside linebacker to me, but uh, what do I know? Uh, another thing, kind of unrelated to everything, but just kind of goes to the, the point that I made earlier, and, and I've made this entire time about the team just not being very good, but about the offense in general. How do you have a record-breaking performance from your wide receiver in one of your quarterback's best games and only score 23? How do you have that generally, at least with Justin Jefferson, and not have a better offense? Here are the guys over at One Bar and Lupik is bringing up something that's really just not being talked about very much, uh, if at all. So let's let's start off with the running game. Let's uh, our running game doesn't appear to be very good. <laughs> it's not oh. very good, and no one's talking about it. We really are one of the worst running offenses in the league. I think we're they rank twenty second in the league yards per attempt at four point one. toward the bottom end of the NFL. Yeah. In that, uh, I look at what happened yesterday. The Lions' run defense is not very good. We mastered, what, 29 yards, 26 yards, something like that. Uh, we've only hit over 100, I think, twice this year. Uh, I, mean, I mean, Delvin has. I think as a team probably hit more than that when, you know, Kirk took uh, off on that one. But uh, just not a very potent running attack right now for Kevin O'Connell's offense. Yeah, we're, uh, we're close to the bottom for total yards. By the way, I kind of talked about this too, didn't I? You can't, I mean, everybody was all excited. We're going, we're going to this Kevin O'Connell spread offense, and we're going to see Dalvin more in the slot. Did we actually think that that wasn't going to negatively impact Dalvin Cook, who already was massively overrated? For reference, Dalvin Cook, who's still getting a ton of carries, but Dalvin Cook has always been uh, near the top in terms of total attempts. In uh, 20, well, right now he ranks sixth. Last year he also ranked sixth in attempts. However, Dalvin Cook has not missed a single game this year. He has 13 attempts, just like everybody else has 13 attempts. That's up near the top. Last year when he ranked sixth in attempts, 250 attempts, he played in 13 total games, which is the same as what he's played the entire year this year. The guys that are above him, 16, 14, 18, 17, and 20. That's 19.2 yards, or excuse me, 19.2 attempts per game. I think I think that would make him second in total attempts, behind only Jonathan Taylor. I mean, his yards per attempt are not lower. He had 4.6 last year. He has 4.5 this year. What he has is less attempts. Now, that's working out for him. He's healthy for the first time maybe ever. So it's probably a net positive, but you're not getting that um, sort of insane level of production, which, you know, the the funny thing is you're going to, he's going to end up with probably more attempts and more yards just because he's going to play more games. He has 213 attempts. Last year, he had 250. Remember, he played the exact same amount of games this year as he did all year of last year. So per game, less attempts, less yards overall. Um, actually, has more touchdowns. But assuming he stays healthy, he's going to end up with a net positive. But the point is, on a game-per-game basis, you don't have that guy that's just battering you over and over and over and over and over. There's just less Dalvin. The other interesting thing is the um, Dalvin Cook is, is going to be split out all that stuff, he has been more. Last year in 13 games, 263 times. So far this year already, 302. Again, same number of games, but it's more. So that's where all those snaps go. He's moving from the backfield to the receiver area or whatever. How's he doing as a receiver? Last year, 34 receptions, 224 yards. This year, 29 receptions, 170 yards. He's performing less well than he did last year. So overall, he's been less of an impact. He's spending more time in the backfield where he is a positive impact, more time in the slot where he's doing less than he was last year. And yeah, as a result, overall, 
the rushing is just not there as a as a total team. It's become it, it it's it's become less of a well-rounded unit and more of just Justin Jefferson. He's he is the offense. Anyways, I have a few more queued up, but I'm just going to leave it at that. We're already getting this episode out a little too late. But um, you guys have yourselves a great day. I will talk to you tomorrow. Have a good one. Bye-bye.